Now, this week on our Sunday evening rugby chat, delighted to welcome former uh, Munster and Connacht uh, out half and fullback as well, Heineken Cup winner and a couple of Celtic leagues as well on top of that. All the way from Australia, from Brisbane, Paul Warwick. Thanks a million for joining us. Good evening where you are. It's good morning uh, uh, here in Dublin. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show, Neil. Um, I said there at the top, out half, a bit of fullback. I wasn't even really sure what position to call you because... I suppose any, anything outside scrum half, you could probably have filled in and done a job in from time to time. Yeah, it certainly um, was both frustrating and um, I guess a blessing, depending on the team I was in. And uh, um, But it certainly helped me, uh, I guess, uh, secure a foothold, especially in the Munster team, um, to be so versatile. Mm. You've been back in Australia now the last few years since uh, since retirement. What have you been up to? I understand a bit of coaching, is it? Yeah, so um, when I arrived back, I took a coaching job at a school, uh, coaching some first 15 rugby, uh, and also started a, a secondary teaching degree, which I completed last year. So I'm now uh, a qualified teacher at the school I, I had the rugby coaching job at, and uh, very happy. And um, yeah, it's a good pathway forward for me. And so what are you teaching then? Uh, physical education. Uh, qualified in uh, physical education and geography. Very good, very good. And is this, I presume, coaching rugby as well at the school? Is this, I think a lot of us over here would probably identify a lot with uh, the school system in Australia. There does seem to be a lot of similarities. It's a big rugby school's culture over in Australia. Is the school you're involved in a school where there, there is a lot of rugby played? It, absolutely. Um, I play in the Premier, sorry, I coach in the Premier uh, Rugby Competition for School Boys in Queensland. Um, my school, unfortunately for me, is, is very academic, so therefore we, uh, we struggle to compete at the top end. But um, nonetheless, uh, playing the long game as a teacher and, uh, and a coach, I, I do get to work with some talented individuals through... Um, some bursaries and scholarships that we bring into the school, um, but probably just not enough to, to be competitive of, of the likes of St. Michael's and, and some of the others in Dublin that, that uh, I had the fortune of visiting on my last trip back to Ireland last year. So that, that was really nice. And is this a little bit similar to Ireland over in Australia that the, the kind of core of the, the top end Australian rugby players are coming out of the school system rather than playing clubs uh, when they're younger? Definitely. Um, it's definitely a school-based system over here rather than club. Um, but what we're finding is uh, a lot of rugby league kids um, are, are probably more talented at an early age. Therefore, uh, they end up at, at our schools through the bursaries and, and therefore don't feed straight into that, that um, I guess, your equivalent AIL club season. Um, and, and go on to, say, a NRL pathway in rugby league instead. So it certainly has hindered uh, the growth of the game over here. But um, in the same breath, you, you could argue that um, Rugby Australia haven't done enough to, to keep the talent that the schools can, can bring in and, and attract through their education and uh, offerings. And I, I guess... It, it's very similar to um, your Leinster Schools Cups and, and things like that. There's a lot of hype around schoolboy rugby union um, and a very prestigious competition. Uh, therefore, you'd think the governing body would sort of cash in on that and, and try and keep some of those really good rugby league kids in the game. But um, unfortunately, they don't have the money to compete with the NRL clubs. From a personal point of view then, are you kind of, are you happy to do the teaching and the coaching for a while or is the coaching something that down the line you're kind of looking to move more into professionally? Uh, to be honest with you, I would love to. Um, it, you know, I, I enjoy coaching. I enjoy working um, in really good environments with uh, talented people. But um, having moved around, around uh, starting in Ireland, um, moving to France and then finishing in England, uh, now resettling in Australia. I couldn't do it to my family. The, the lifestyle's uh, too volatile. Um, 
yeah, it, it's one of those things. That I would love the job, but um, yeah, it's too volatile for for a family and um, uh, a non-sporting wife. Put it that way. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good answer. It's a very good answer. <laughs> Is it something then potentially? Uh, you know, when when the kids are older, when when they're away, as you know, when they've moved off to college and when they've kind of gone off doing their own things in life, is it something that you might potentially try to look at a little bit further down the line? De- definitely not in Australia. Uh, that would only occur probably coming back to Ireland, I would imagine, um, or Europe. Um, but, uh, yeah, never say never. Um, uh, as I said, it's... Uh, it- wonderful environment to play work in. Um, I'd really enjoy it. So uh, at the moment, it, teaching and, um, and keeping the family settled. We've been back in Australia. This is our fifth year. Um, so that, that's a really strong priority for me um, to have my 10-year-old daughter grow up with a group of friends. Um, uh, I have a, a stepdaughter who's now 20. And uh, unfortunately, through my rugby career, she was moved around a bit. And uh, it was unsettling and, and probably a bit unfair on her. And um, yeah, try not to, to make that mistake again in the immediate future anyway. <laughs> I suppose the issue of the travelling is probably a nice way to kind of start off because you did probably do a lot of it early on in your career. You would have been down playing for uh, the Manly Club in, uh, mm-hmm. in Sydney and then obviously on the seven circuit for a couple of years as well before ultimately com- uh, coming to Connacht. Tell us about the Connacht move. How did that all come together? That was the first trip into Ireland. Andrew Farley was uh, a friend of mine. He was, I don't think he was captain at the time, but he was a senior player at Connacht. Um, asked, uh, inquired about what I was doing. Um, and one thing led to another. I sent some tapes over or whatever was the go in the day. And, uh, ended up meeting Michael Bradley at Twickenham um, when we played in the London IRB Sevens tournament there. And, um, yeah, I think it was a month or two months later, I was in Galway uh, for race week and then starting the season. Race week, that's a nice introduction to Galway, right at the right at the top of the uh, season. That's, that's the best way to get used to, to Galway as a city, I think. I was I was shocked. I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, is it like this every weekend? But <laughs> obviously they cleared out and I'd signed and sealed delivered by then. So, uh, no, I really enjoyed my time at, at, at Connacht. Um, you know, it was tough initially with uh, the transition with the weather and, and things like that. But um, beautiful city, um, lots of good people. Um, rugby-wise, frustrating. Um, when at that time it, it wasn't what it is now, uh, it was more a, a feeder club to to the Leinsters, Munsters, and Ulsters. Um, but uh, it gave me a really good grounding. I was there three years, uh, um, and it gave me a really good grounding in in Europe. And and you know, I came over and I was trying to run the ball from everywhere and. Uh, and do some do some crazy things, which worked some days and didn't work other days. So you were a hero and villain. But um, you know, initially competing for a position with Eric Elwood, who was finishing his career, uh, and then um, playing with you know lots of good players that, as I said at the start, went off and and had great careers at, at Leinster, Munster, and Ulster as well. So, mm-hmm. like as you said, there, Connacht at the time very much the fourth province in Irish rugby. Mm. But I think, as you also kind of said, probably an excellent breeding ground and a place for, for you to really, really kind of learn the learn the ranks in pro rugby, having come off the seven circuit. Mm. I would say coming from the seven circuit to playing at the sports ground every week, two completely different worlds altogether. Oh, absolutely. Um, well, funnily enough, my first game was against... Uh, Newcastle Falcons and Johnny Wilkinson and that that whole road show came to Galway so uh, yeah it, it was it was a great time um, definitely learning the the fact that uh, the European season has two seasons within it so when you can throw the ball around at the start of the year and and probably from about April um, but the rest is pretty conservative and and a bit of a hard slog um, 
uh, and with Connacht, as you said, the fourth province, I, I can remember going out and gold kicking uh, on the dog track and uh, being kicked off because the dogs were running. So uh, it really put uh, the priority heavily in favour of the dogs rather than the rugby players back then. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Like, interesting there, you're kind of saying there are two seasons in the kind of northern mm. hemisphere season the start of the season where you have the nice weather and the tail end of the season where it's good and mm. right that the bulk of the season really in between where the weather's poor and all that how much did you have to kind yeah. of alter your game uh when you arrived in to kind of adjust to that and did it take a little bit of time for you to actually figure out okay i can't just kind of play the play the australian way here for a full season yeah it it, it did take a bit of time um uh, I, I don't know whether I was just quite brazen or, or not, but you know, growing up in Australia, you, you don't kick the ball a lot. Um, and then seeing the best player in Ireland and, and probably the best 10 in Europe at the time, Ronan O'Gara, just phenomenal positioning of the ball. And and I guess from, from watching a lot of rugby and, and seeing how opponents such as Johnny Wilkinson and, and guys I got to play against... Um, controlled the game that that was my biggest learning coming from northern to southern hemi- sorry southern to northern hemisphere um uh you know you, you're re- reliant on the forwards a lot more if you don't have go forward it's a tough day at the office uh hence why munster at the time were, were a real presence in europe and and uh leinster ended up being you know a real strong uh team based on on their forward dominance and um you know at, at munster having a lot of young people trying to to um, challenge the likes of uh, your Leo Cullens at, at Leinster at the time and your Paul O'Connells uh, at Munster. It, it was tough playing behind a pack like that. So, you know, you, you threw it around and if it come off, it looked good. And uh, if it didn't, yeah, you probably wore, or well, I probably wore a lot of the, the blame for the results. So, you know, you, you win some, you lose some, but uh, I think it all worked out in the end for me. Talking about Munster then, was that a move that, did Munster come calling or did you go seeking them out? Um, I, I had had conversations. Um, Tony McGann was, uh, I think he came in 2006, sort of halfway through that 2005, 2006 year that they won it the first time. Uh, he was a high school teacher of mine. Um, and I had you know, lots of dealings with him over the years and uh, met him after one of the, the, the games against uh, Munster and uh, had a brief conversation. And um, as I said, I, I sort of, by that third year at Munster, I, I was starting to, to work out the European scene. And when I arrived and you know, I was playing a bit of footy and I couldn't understand why um, people would be content sitting on the bench at, at Munster or Leinster um, and not come to Connacht to, to challenge your, your starting players at, at, for Ireland. Um, that was just something that I couldn't compute with and until I went to Munster and, and you're in an environment that's challenging and it's um, demanding and it really draws the best out of you. So um, it was a challenge that, that I... I wanted to be involved in big games. Um, by that third season at, at Munster, I think I'd played in uh, a Challenge Cup final series um, with Connacht, of which Sale tore us apart. And then um, just getting a taste of those games and, and seeing what Munster had achieved, uh, it was something that I wanted to be a part of. And um, funnily enough, my wife now, uh, who I met in Galway, was from Cork uh, or from Mallow, just out of Cork. And, and whilst she didn't want to move back home, um, it was sort of a natural fit that we went to Limerick and, um, and had four great years there. Mm-hmm. And going in the door then, the, the change room door at Monster, how quickly did it take you to, to get up to speed with, with what they were doing there? Like, did you notice there was a gulf between Connacht and Monster that you had to adjust to? Massive, massive. <laughs> so... Um, uh, I vomited in my first weight session 
um, at Munster. Uh, I can remember it at UL. Um, and then uh, my wife's family were holidaying in, in France at the time. So I was staying in Mallow while our house was settling in Limerick. And um, I was stuck upstairs. I'd gone to bed and I couldn't walk the next day. My legs were that sore from just the first weight session. Um, and it was something that wouldn't happen at, at, at Connacht, sorry. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was an interesting introduction to, to Munster. Um, what I will say is that the people, um, success was bred through hard work and, uh, it was just something that I really needed at that point in my career, just to be surrounded by people that wanted to work hard. And I'm talking about, you know, Jerry Flannery's, Marcus Horan's, Ian Dowling's, um, guys that were fantastic players in their own right, but probably weren't superstars, but just worked really hard um, to maximise their performance. And it, it certainly helped me. And I think it, it's still helping uh, a few of the people that, that are there today. And I think in your first season at Munster, they probably, as a team, they probably actually did have something to prove. Having having won the Heineken Cup in 2006, 2007 had been a, a real letdown of a year. And to come back in 2007 mm. and eight. The, there definitely was a bit of pressure and a point to prove, I would say, within that team to to go on and, and do what they did and actually get get the Heineken Cup back again. Um, yeah, yeah, I think um, the year I came, um, Rua Tapoki came as well, mm. um, and Doug Howlett joined in um, January, I think, yeah, uh, of two thousand and eight. So. Um, they weren't missing a lot, um, and, and you know, having not been there before, I can't comment on on, on what went wrong in that season. But um, I distinctly remember a, a meeting where Declan Kidney was was speaking about um, this group of players uh, deserved a lot more than just one title. So uh, there was a strong belief that obviously they'd done it in two thousand and six, and and broken that barrier down and, and a real hunger to, to get back to those winning ways. Um, frustratingly enough, we, well, we won it that year, but um, the two semi-finals, they, they, they were tough losses uh, in 2009 and 10. Mm-hmm. On 2008, I imagine a pretty special feeling to to be involved in that Heineken Cup success. I know you didn't actually you know get on to play in the final against Toulouse, but you were in the match day squad and part of that season as well. Yeah. Yeah, best seat in the house. Um, <laughs> I think in that Heineken Cup season, I probably played about 30 minutes in total. So, um, yeah, whilst I, I, I certainly wanted to play, it was um, fantastic exposure and definitely springboarded me uh, for that 2009 season. Just so hungry. I want to be on the field. I have to be on the field. Um you know, I want to be a part of it and I want to influence outcomes of games rather than, you know, walking back in the sheds and, and um, you know, celebrating other people's success, if you like. Yeah, and as you referenced earlier, like, there was a fairly formidable character wearing the number 10 shirt for Munster when you arrived. Mm. A fairly established figure in Roland O'Gara. And, you know, you kind of said there you couldn't understand players kind of settling to be on the bench. When you were going to Munster, had you in your mind... Did you have this idea in your head that you could, that you wanted to displace Ron Nogar out of a ten shirt, that you could do it, or were you going there to kind of to further the career, to learn more about yourself as a player? Uh, what if I said both? Um, I was, what was I? Uh, I think I was twenty-seven. Yeah, about twenty-seven. So, um, yeah, I, I was a bit naive to think that I could displace him. Um, certainly wasn't anywhere near the level that I needed to be to displace him. I can honestly say that. Um, very different game plans, obviously, um, that suited me and suited him. Um, but I definitely, working with someone who um, pushes themselves every session and is so dedicated to his craft and demands so much out of people, uh, I probably learnt more in, in that first year than um, to all of my rugby prior. Um, just in, in relationships, talking to people, standards, um, 
and, and controlling games. Uh, hey, Ronan, whilst we weren't very close, he, he was very good good to me and um, yeah, made me a better player because uh, I guess he, he obviously didn't want to be displaced and, and it would have been you know, probably a, a big call for for someone at Munster to to know, have their number ten or the Irish number ten sitting on the bench, um, but uh, certainly as time grew, I didn't go to Munster to be a fullback. That, that's for sure. Uh, I went there as a number ten and and solely as a as a ten and wanted to challenge uh, Ronan as as best I could, I guess. And you mentioned fullback. Ultimately, it's kind of fullback where. I would say a lot of the Munster fans probably have some of their best memories of you. Mm-hmm. Because the following season was where they really started to see you uh, at fullback. Um, mm-hmm. Was that something that it, uh, Tony McGahan, who would have been the head coach at that stage, taken over from Declan Kidney, was he approaching you to kind of say, you know, I, I know you're able to do a job here for me at fullback? Or did you kind of come to him and say, I want to be more involved in the, in the first 15, I'll play wherever you want me to play? Yeah, I can't. I can't off the top of my head remember exactly what happened. Um, uh, I, I may have got some time in in some league games there and sort of sort of done enough. Um, I know Declan gave me some opportunities in my first year uh, at fullback, um, and I pro- I definitely didn't set the world alight there. Uh, Sean Payne and, and Dennis Hurley were probably. Uh, the two main fullbacks then, but um, uh, I remember playing a game in the Heineken Cup against Sale. It was probably my first big opportunity uh, at fullback, and and that was the that was, well the, that was the away game, wasn't it? The away game yeah, at Sale. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so whilst I was very nervous, uh, I think I did a couple of couple of nice things, and. Um, uh, I didn't play it. I played the return game, but I didn't play against the back-to-back Claremont games. Um, I think they went with Barry Murphy in the centre and, and moved someone around. I can't remember, but um, yeah, that, that gave me a real taste for it. And uh, I, I guess um, uh, by the end of that season, I think that's when we played the Ospreys in the quarterfinal and, and I had a very good game. That sort of really helped me cement the spot for a, for a short period of time. Um, uh, what I bought at fullback was probably allowed guys like uh, Lafemi Murphy and Keith Earls and, and Doug and um, Ian Dowling, just that second ball player where we could play with a bit more width and, and accuracy, a second kicking option at fullback. Um, so it, it gave us a lot of versatility and, and you'd know from... From watching us back then, we were probably the smallest back line in Europe, but very effective through uh, uh, Murphy's strength as a little fella and, and Keith Earls' speed. And obviously, Doug was a huge threat on, on one of the wings and, and Ian Dowling never let anyone down. So uh, whilst we weren't uh, a very big back line, I think just the, the skill sets of each player really complemented each other and allowed us to be quite expansive that year. Yeah, like it's something you see a lot of now uh, in modern rugby, where teams have kind of two, two first receivers, two ball players out on uh, out on the pitch. You look at England, um, mm-hmm. uh, in particular, a great example of it with Owen mm-hmm. Farrell and George Ford. For yeah. Munster to be doing that at the time, having Ron Nagara ten and yourself at fullback, it obviously created difficulty for a lot of teams because you mentioned the Ospreys game there, uh, that quarter final where you had man at the match. Obviously, they were in a situation where they kicked it long a couple of times straight into your hands, and you had those two monster drop goals that everyone remembers from, I think, was, was one of them maybe inside your own half or just inside their half as well. And, you know, th- that creates the danger, yeah, it's roughly, the uncertainty. Yeah. It's the, hmm. it's, it's, you know, there's no safe space to be, to be kicking a ball loose. Yeah, it, it's, it certainly um, became, a, a, I guess, a, a threat that if, if teams did kick loose, uh, potentially could punish them but um, yeah it, it was just a really good time to play uh, playing with that carefree attitude I guess a bit of arrogance where um, you go on the field and you just expect to win and you're out there to compete and and our forward pack was doing their job um, uh, that was one of the ma- major factors at, at Munster at the time is if you did your job as best you could you know 
the people around you would do the same and, and it sort of gave us a bit of success and, and confidence, uh, certainly not complacency, but just that arrogance that you go on the field and, and you expect to win. Um, yeah, it was really exciting to be a part of. The semi-final against Leinster in 2009, you'd mentioned it that, you know, 2009 and 10, those semi-finals were incredibly tough to take. Was, was, was the team that lost to Leinster in 2009, was that group of players, that, that squad over the season, I don't know, I would have thought it personally uh, previously, were you a better team that season than the one that actually won it the previous year? And just ultimately, oh, came, un- ultimately came unstuck against an unbelievable Leinster team? Yeah, I mentioned it earlier. The the forwards, um, I don't know what Michael Checker did, uh, and I won't give him all the credit, but um, certainly in that game, we just couldn't get a foothold uh, that we were used to, I, I guess, in, in the pack. Uh, it's easy to throw the ball around, but you, you need to have, have impacted uh, the defensive lines through, through your forward play and... and I guess manipulated some defenders, so you're creating space, and it just didn't happen for us. Um, uh, and even even to the extent in that game, I think Felipe Contepomi was was injured very early on, uh, and and Sexton got his chance, and obviously uh, had a fantastic career from there. But um, it, yeah, you can't put your finger on it. I think it was twenty something to to six or or something like that. I, I think I've tried to forget the score, but um, it's, uh, yeah, you just never felt in the game. Um, We were never in control and and just didn't get the bounce of the ball on the day. Um, Certainly, that was the best rugby we'd played uh, and probably did play in my time at Munster. And, um, yeah, one of those days where it didn't go and it just happened to be uh, at Crow Park in front of heaps of people, unfortunately. That that day was probably right in the middle of, I'd say maybe like the the ten year period where that Munster Leinster rivalry was absolutely mm. at its peak because when they used to play each other, unfortunately, where it is now where you have a lot of the <clears throat> a lot of the Irish internationals are being rested for those games because they're falling mm. in the Christmas period. But you would have had a lot of them maybe before the big Heineken Cup weekends, where all the stars were going to be out there and it was absolutely hell for leather between mm. those two sides. Uh, definitely, uh, I don't know. Not, uh, I'm sure everyone did it, but um, if you got named for that that team, that was like getting named for a Heineken Cup game. Um, you knew where you sat in the pecking order if you were playing against Leinster. Um, it, uh, yeah, they were phenomenal games and always tight. And, and um, I, I guess that that semi final loss. Uh, springboarded Leinster to probably five or six games where they beat us in a row, which uh, uh, maybe not five, but close enough. But um, yeah, that that was a really changing of the guard moment. And um, but yeah, those games were ferocious and uh, uh, it, it was fantastic to, to be a part of. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people forget maybe the, the 2010 season. It kind of seems to fade from a lot of people's memories because it wasn't probably as high profile a defeat as the Leinster game was and, you know, ultimately mm. not winning it. But getting to the semi-final, again, it was a it was a monster team that were firing on all cylinders for much of the season. Like the mm. absolutely, uh, that very, very famous win against Northampton, the, you know, winning that five metre scrum under, the, under your own post yeah. and then absolutely demolishing the Northampton Saints then again in the, um, in the quarterfinals, but mm. just so, so flat against Spirits in the semis. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's really bizarre. Um, uh, that was one of the toughest weeks of my life. Um, my daughter was born, and and she has um, she was born with cystic fibrosis. So uh, I didn't train all week. Uh, I was up in Dublin, um, so she was born on a Wednesday. So I was out till then, uh, and then was taken up to Dublin on the Thursday uh, to Crumlin. So I was sort of commuting and, and trying to train and, and, and be with my family. And uh, I flew out to to Beeritz, I think, late. Um, uh, and it was up in the air whether I was going to play. But, yeah, it was just, I don't know, again, John de Villiers was part of the team. Um, so, so we weren't lacking talent. Uh, 
and uh, Biarritz were were a scrappy team. Uh, obviously, I think Yash really kicked um, I don't know six or seven penalties, and, and they didn't score a try against us. So uh, um, it was a frustrating loss. Uh, Keith Earls, I think, scored very early, and uh, just one of those games that didn't flow uh, probably how we expected, or uh, we didn't do enough early to to put them away to keep them out of reach with penalties. Mm-hmm. I'll stop talking about disappointments now in the for Munster. I'll I'll, t- I'll talk about a good day in particular. Um, well, a couple of good days. One did end in defeat. The All Blacks game, the Australia game. I imagine for you personally, though, the Australia one was was a pretty sweet one, kicking all those points in the the wind and the rain in Thoma Park on that uh, that midweek night. I was speaking to James Collin on the show last week, who obviously captained the team that evening as well, and he was talking about just there were quite a few of those Australian players who weren't really prepared for not just the team itself, but the weather conditions in Limerick on that night. Mm. Yeah, it was it was horrendous conditions. Um, uh, but yeah, it was really, really sweet to, to having never played for the Wallabies, um, to play against my friends and, and people I grew up with. Um, and to beat them, you know, it wasn't the Australian team, uh, obviously, but uh, a second string, um, but what makes it better is the amount of academy academy guys we had in our team. Um, uh, I think there was only uh, three, three or four frontline monster players in that team that won. And again, it's probably um, a tribute to uh, my education of European rugby, as opposed to Jim you know, Berwick Barnes and and the halves that that played for. Um, for Australia that night, um, playing the conditions, and I think we we went uh, into the gale to start with, and uh, led at half time, or it was six all at half time, or, or something like that, and the game was in the bag. There was no way they were going to beat us um, at half time. So uh, yeah, really, really pleasing, entertaining night. Um, personally, a lot of self satisfaction to. To sort of stick one up my countrymen, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, no, very enjoyable night. You mentioned like the the academy guys in the team at that stage. Like I remember that night, Peter O'Mahony would have played that night. He was absolutely fantastic. I think Connor Murray came off the bench as well. And I can't remember whether or not Keith Earls was involved. He could have been involved with the Irish team that week. But he was. He did play. No, he, he, played, he did he play. Played, yeah. He was. He was a few years into his Irish career as well. And mm. you know, these are the. The three guys who were at the very early stages of their career at that around that time, mm. but ultimately have, have pretty much been the backbone of this monster team for the last the last decades. Were, could you yeah. see things in them when they were at that age? That you know, what was it about those kind of kids? I think Peter O'Mahony in particular. There was always this reputation that he was kind of he did have this kind of wisdom above his ears. Yeah, I think what what Pete had very young was. Um, just that competitive nature to you know that he, he's sort of an old school rugby player, if you like, in a modern era in terms of uh, he would have thrived in those days with, with Claw and, and where they were kicking the crap out of each other at training. And um, to a lesser extent, when, you know, Alan Quinlan's and uh, Mick O'Driscoll's and all those guys were, were competing for, for positions with you know, David Wallace's and... Paul O'Connell's, John Hayes, all these guys. Um, so Pete got a fantastic apprenticeship um, watching these guys at training every every day. Um, he also was probably tarred with the leadership brush very early, which obviously helps um, just in how he composed himself um, and how he was sort of thought by his peers. Um, so that, that certainly... Uh, was a feather in his cap at the time. Connor Murray is another one who, um, you know, personally at the time, I, I wouldn't have said, wouldn't have thought Connor would have got to the heights that he did. So, um, uh, fantastic player and, and his composure and how he can control a game at nine is is a real credit to him. Um, personally, when I look back on my time there, playing with Tommaso Leary was fantastic because I loved, uh, playing with someone who was a threat. Um, I wouldn't say Connor's a, a massive attacking threat, but how he can control a game in, in that manner is, is is fantastic with his kicking and, and his pace of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, that was obviously your, your final season with Munster that summer of 2011. You 
moved on to Stade Francais. I might bring it back to a couple of years previous when you almost did leave uh, London Irish. There have been London mm-hmm. Irish had said there was a, a signature on a piece of paper. They were saying <laughs> you changed your mind. Ultimately, all parties agreed and worked things out and you stayed in Munster for another couple of seasons. What happened with that London Irish move at the time? Uh, I signed with London Irish and I was fully committed to going. Um, uh, there was lots of back and forth with, um, I suppose I've got to take you right back. Uh, when I first came to Ireland uh, to play with Connacht, it was under the pretense that I could qualify and, and potentially play for Ireland. Um, so I did my three years. Um, I think at the time it was three years and then you could qualify. Um, but I fell into a bit of a void because I'd played Australian sevens which categorised me as essentially playing for the Wallabies without, obviously, in Australia, it was ranked below the under-21s, if you like, or under-20s, what it is now, uh, in terms of pecking order. So, um, like Amy Murphy fell into the same boat with with the Mary, or so the, the New Zealand Sevens as well. Um, uh, so, uh, Ireland were at the time looking at limiting how many foreign players they could have. Um, and I was sort of on the cusp of uh, getting, I wanted a longer term deal. I think I would turned, uh, what was I, 29 at the time. Um, and, and I was looking for a two or three year deal and uh, they could only give me a one year contract. So I had a young family and, and wanted that stability. So I definitely signed, uh, did the whole thing. And, um, it was a pretty tough phone call to make because uh, Munster came back and said, look, RFU have relaxed the rules. You, you can stay if you want to. Um, I remember Paul O'Connell coming around to the house to, to persuade me as well. And, of course, I wanted to stay. I, I love the place. And, and um, you know, we've spoken about a lot of the, the fond memories that I've had there. Um, so, yeah, I, I said... I'm in, I want to stay. And um, I had to call Toby Booth uh, at, at London Irish and didn't kind of go as expected. I, I sort of let him know that I wouldn't be joining the team. Um, and he sort of disagreed and said, uh, I expect to see you on day one when when we start pre-season training. And um, then I sort of backed out of that. I'd made the phone call and, and said my piece and I think Garrett Fitzgerald, um, uh, who was fantastic for to me and my family at the time, uh, stepped up and, and took over negotiations. And you know, I, I don't know the ins and outs of the deal, um, but yeah, I think London Irish did quite well out of it. So <laughs> we'll leave we'll leave it there. So and um, <laughs> so 2011. Then when you did leave, um, obviously it was for those same reasons that you weren't qualified to play for Ireland and mm-hmm. ultimately if you're not qualified to, to play for Ireland you're kind of surplus to requirements as far as the mm-hmm. IRFU concerned how difficult is that to, to deal with because at that stage you have you have an Irish family you know you're you're mm-hmm. settled you're settled down in the country and having to uproot a family to to move off to France initially then England after that but you know particularly I think for someone who has you know, establish an Irish family and has settled down here. I imagine it's incredibly difficult. We would have seen it similar a few years ago with, with Ruin Pinar and Ulster, for example. Um, uh, well, I don't think it, it was too difficult um, when I made the decision or when my wife and I made the decision. We, um, she spent a lot of time in France in a holiday home um, that, that her parents have down in the south of France. And um, it's something that I'd always wanted to to try every time we'd go with the Heineken Cup or, or the Challenge Cup when I was at Connacht. Um, it was definitely, a, I guess, a life experience I, I wanted to try. Um, and having an Australian coach w- was definitely appealing. Um, if I had my time over, I would take the one-year contract and, and stay at Munster um, and, and, I guess, fight for that one-year contract year after year. Um, but at the time, it was a three-year deal. It was a lot more money and sort of um, scratched an itch that I'd wanted to uh, to experience for a long time. 
So um, all those cards fell into place. It, it was, I guess, one of those Osprey scenarios. It was a Galactico team that, that had no substance, just a, a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a lot of very good players that um, didn't play well together as a team and um, a lot of politics as well behind the scenes, um, which was ultimately Michael Checker's demise. And um, yeah, I, I sort of got out of there. I, I saw out two years of my three-year contract and, and um yeah, we went to Worcester after that. So, uh, yeah, it was an experience. Um, if I hadn't have done it, I would have wished I had. So, um, you know, it, it's one of those things in hindsight. I, I, I probably would have um, enjoyed, I guess, fighting for my spot with uh, Felix Jones at the time for fullback at Munster. Mm-hmm. And I suppose before you did leave mm-hmm. Munster, you did... You did get to go out on a high, the the Magnus League final against Leinster, getting getting one last trophy. I would say as well, a, a nice feeling as well, being able to do it with someone you'd mentioned had been a teacher of yours previously, Tony McGahan as well, that, you know, all of a sudden here you are, whatever, 20 odd years later at the other side of the world, lifting a, mm. lifting a trophy together. Yeah, definitely. Well, funnily enough, um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, he works probably 300 metres down the road from, from my school at, at one of our rival schools at the moment as the director of sport. So, um, You've come full circle. Yeah, it, it <laughs> <coughs> certainly have. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was really nice. Um, very sad uh, for, to leave with um, um, Paul Derbyshire, who was one of the fitness trainers. Um, at the start of that season, he, he got motor neuron disease or, or um, was diagnosed with motor neurons and uh, deteriorated that 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 year uh, quite rapidly. And I think he was in a, in a wheelchair on stage with us at, um, by the end and, and passed not, not long after. But um, yeah, it, it was it was great. Um, you know, everyone would prefer to go out a winner and, and I was lucky enough to have that send off. And you've been back to, to Limerick and Cork and Ireland quite a few times since. Obviously, you've mentioned the Irish family. It's, it's somewhere you go regularly enough. I've, I've seen your, your Twitter. Your, kind of, your Twitter feed seems to be exclusively reserved for monster tweets. Just kind of check, yeah, checking in every few weeks or every month or so and just say something nice about um, the, the people in Limerick and Cork and we'll check back out again. <laughs> I, I, I get up and watch the games. Um, you know, I think they, uh, the afternoon games are on early in the morning. But uh, if it's a night game, it, you know, I get up early here, um, and it's sort of time fits uh, as my family did when I was playing over there. But yeah, I, I really miss the place. To be honest, uh, you know, it holds the greatest rugby memories for me when I played. Um, so it, it, it's a really special place, and you know, my having roots there with. With now my my kids, um, both being born or Era being born in in Limerick and and Leah, um, my stepdaughter, um, yeah, it's you know I, I miss the place and you know, as I said, it's fond memories. Well, Paul, listen, it's been absolutely fantastic having you on the show, and thanks a million for taking time out of your evening uh, down in Brisbane. It's been a pleasure having you on, Paul Warwick. Thank you. Appreciate your time, Neil. Bye.